Sanctuary in Beach Grove, Indiana. I am Dr. Mike Baldock, and I'm standing in for Pastor Tim today. Uh, just be praying for them. They're just a tad bit under the weather, but they're fine. So uh, they'll be back with us by next week. I'm excited about what God has given me today. I, I have um, one of my deepest concerns that I have uh, after all the years in the ministry is looking at the modern-day church and seeing how that uh, we have allowed, uh, uh, actually we've allowed sin to creep into our modern-day churches. Um, that's one concern I have. The other concern that I have, and my, my wife and I were talking about this the other day, and I want you to think about this because uh, the thought I have in mind uh, to share with you today is called, uh, what is the Lord requiring of you, of us? What is it that the Lord wants out of us? I don't know if some of you have ever been to the place in your life where you've, where you've uh, worked and worked and worked and done things and done this and done that, and then you're like, God, what do you expect out of me? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning, and I hope it'll be a blessing. But as we, before we do and as we do, I want you to keep this in mind. How are we to face the enemy uh, that's before us today? Uh, and I don't like to give the enemy any kind of credit, but I do have to say uh, that this past year, uh, he, he didn't have to do much to disrail um, uh, 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 a lot of people. And we're facing a far greater pandemic than the COVID-19 thing. The pandemic that we're facing today is of sins that's entered into our churches. Somebody somewhere has got to take a stand. Uh, think about this. And, and this is what Julie and I was talking about the other day. Think about what would have happened. Here you've got, a, here you've got an army that's a trained army. Their leader, by, the name, by a man by the name of Saul... The Bible talks about and describes him as being head and shoulders above everybody in Israel. So he, Saul was a big man in, in his own right. And, they, and these guys all knew warfare. They were trained in warfare. Yet a giant called Goliath uh, roars out and that army shrinks back. That, that's troubling me because when I look about what happened to us in 2020, man, there was a, there was a giant that roared. And the churches started shrinking back. Do you know there's churches that have closed during the last year that will never open their doors again? And you know what that is? That's a victory for the enemy. Uh, some way, somehow, we got to stand up and we got to say, okay, enough is enough. And we're going to take control of this situation uh, by the grace of God. So if you have your Bibles and you want to go along with me, I'm going to be reading out of the book of Micah, uh, chapter, chapter number 6. Uh, this is a, a, a Michael was an often uh, was an awesome prophet. I think uh, du du he he prophesied during the Assyrian crisis uh, while they were in the Babylonian captivity. Uh, Michael spoke strongly against immorality. He spoke strongly against social injustices uh, and the oppression of the poor by the rich. Uh, he also uh, uh, spoke strongly uh, about Israel compromising. And taking on the culture of their captors. In other words, uh, Bab Babylon took Israel in, and it wasn't long while Israel was there that Israel compromised her beliefs and became involved in the Babylonian uh, way of living, uh, got their culture. I'm telling you, if you'll look and pray and let the Holy Spirit uh, speak to you, you'll find out that that very thing is happening in our churches today. Now, watch this. Uh, God had chosen Michael exclusively to reveal the birthplace of the Messiah. In other words, he was going to tell him, here's where your hope is. Here's what's going to get the job done for you. So Michael, Micah was able, and I love this about this man, Michael was able to see beyond their current situation. Now, think about that for a minute. Uh, I've, I've said this a lot, I, I, and I continue to say it. Uh, God gave me this revelation several years ago that one of the problems we have as, 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 as people, uh, and even as Christians, is that a whole lot of us live from the outside in rather than the inside out. And what I mean by that statement is we allow what's going on around us to dictate how we feel and think on the inside of us. 
which is exactly what the enemy wants us to do. But if we could take the word of God that is within us and keep us away from the stuff that's around us, what I mean by that is not letting it affect us. I'm not talking about speaking in and telling it to go. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about not allowing the negative stuff that's around us to affect the way we feel and the way we think inside of us as directed by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit. So watch here because in, in, in Micah beginning at chapter 6 uh, and the beginning of verse number 1, uh, th there's a key word that I want you to pick up on here that God uses because God's now speaking to Israel and telling them what, he's, what he requires of them. The key word that's recorded is he, uh, key, actually two words, hear ye or hear you. Uh, it makes you wonder uh, how or if the church is hearing what the Lord's saying today. Here, here's a problem about hearing. Have you ever played the game where you, you, you have a, a line of people and you whisper in somebody's ear and the, then they take what you said and whisper it in somebody else's ear and it goes down the line? And by the time the last person gets it, very rarely is it like the very first thing that was ever said. You know why? That's because when we hear stuff, we insert our own opinions and our own ideas, uh, which can damage what we're hearing. Uh, you know, God could care less about our opinion about the Word of God because our opinion about it is not going to get us anywhere. Uh, and here's what I like to think about. I don't care what goes on. Uh, and here we just had an experience at our nation's capital, uh, and there's a changing of the guard, so to speak. I don't care what goes on. God's still God. None of this stuff that's been going on in America and throughout the world is keeping God from being God. He's still God. Uh, and, and, and he's not going to change. So listen to this, because uh, this is very important. He said, hear you now uh, what the Lord says. Arise and continue, uh, continue before the mountains, and let the hear, hills hear your voice. Now, this is important because in the view of the tremendous prophecies given through Micah, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit concerning Israel, and now the prophets uh, uh, make, make, a, make a strident appeal to the people to uh, uh, come to order. And some of them hopefully will repent. That's what the word arise is all about. I think that the church, I think we Christians, now I, I, I know we tell the sinners this, but I'm talking about the Christians right now. I think it's time that we arise. I think it's time that we arise and, and, and get a fight within us. Uh, that, that comes against the enemy, <clears throat> excuse me, that's warring against us. Look at verse 2. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy. Wow. And you strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. In other words, it's saying here, uh, there's stuff you're doing I don't like. God's saying there's things going on among my people. And here's an important thing about this. Something that I enjoy about this. He's not talking about the things going on with the Babylonian people. He's talking about the things going on with Israel. His folk, if so to speak, if I can use that term. And he's saying, there's a controversy going on here. There's some things that I don't like, and there's some things that need to be straightened up. Now, I don't know about you, and I don't know where you feel to, how you feel today uh, that are listening through social media, but I know one thing. As long as I'm serving, as long as I've been serving God and preaching this great gospel, there are still things that need to be changed in my life. Uh, and I've said this many, many times. Thank God I'm not what I used to be, but thank God I'm not yet what I'm going to be, for the Holy Spirit is still working on me. He should be doing that. That's what this word arise is. It's saying let's arise and let's allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in us. You know what the, one of the things, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but one of the things that the Holy Spirit is trying to do in our lives is he's trying to get our condition to meet our spiritual position. In other words, when Christ came into your life, came into our life, into the life of the believing sinners, he placed us in a position. The sad part about that is a lot of us have not reached the condition to, be, to work in that position. And this is where Israel's at. Israel has a position. Well, now watch this. Even though some bad stuff was going on here, Israel still had not lost, lost her position with God. But Israel's condition was not right. So God said, I got a controversy. Look at verse 3. Oh, my people, 
What have I done unto you? And wherein have I wearied you? Testify against me. I like this. I like this statement right here. In the entirety of the Bible, no pleading is done so graphically and tenderly as it's brought as it is here. And the the term testify against me is the same as a court of law. Uh, the Lord is bringing forth His case, and He demands that Israel bring forth her case. It, it, it most quickly and thought thoroughly the entirety of the earth. Watch this, and for all time, no person can stand and honestly testify against God that he has wronged them in any way, shape, or form. I, I, we just had, uh, Julie and I, we just had uh, uh, someone close to, to our family, uh, in the family, uh, that, that, uh, that died of this dreaded thing that's going on in the world. And, uh, and she was not a very, she wasn't very old. And uh, one of the things that happened was, first of all, the, the thing was, I don't even want to talk about God. Why would God let that happen to her? So all of a sudden, when things don't go our way, and I understand people in their grief and sorrow, but think about this for a minute. All of a sudden, when things are in our life and they're not going the way we think we should go, now it's all God's fault. And I just, I, I wonder about that mindset and what it does for us as far as putting us in a position to walk in victory. Look at verse 4. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of the servants. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted. And what Balaam, the son of Beor, uh, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal. That ye may know the righteousness of the, of the Lord. That's what he's wanting to show to us. Let's get to the meat of this thing. Verse number six. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Watch. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year? Wow. Now, this, this last part is uh, an important part to get a hold of. Uh, because when he is saying here, the calves of the year... They're talking about, they're, they're actually talking about babies. Israel had got into place, just like the Babylonian people, that they were sacrificing their children to false gods. They compromised so much that they got to that area. So it goes on to say in, in, in verse 7, watch what they, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit, the fruit of, my, of my body for the sin of my soul? The question is, <clears throat> will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Wow. It insinuates, there's an insinuation here uh, that the people come, have came to the place where they thought quantity enhanced the value. Wow. You know what God's looking for you and I? He's not looking for quantity from us. He's looking for quality. Because that's what being born again is all about. It's changing from a life of quantity to a life of quality. Uh, and and that's, what God, that's what God wants to do with us. Because in, in, in this verse, uh, the Lord is plainly saying that none of these, even the offerings of one son or daughter, are offering the fruit of, of your body uh, will atone for the sins. It's not going to do it. Now, what does that have to do with you and I today? What does that have to do with the modern day church? You can say, well, that's, you know, that's great information, but he's talking to Israel here. So how can we correlate that uh, with the church of today? Here's how you do it. We often, we often, I've been there and done this. We have often put works ahead of faith, thinking that God's going to be pleased with our works no matter where our faith is at. And listen to me, Saint, that, that is totally backwards. Works never produces faith. However, faith will always produce works. So in other words, I'm saying this, whatever your calling is in your life, whatever you feel like the Lord wants you to do, 
uh, wherever you feel like you're at right now uh, in, in, in the Lord. God's looking for your faith to be in action and not your works. Uh, although works bring glory to God, but only, only, only if they're followed by faith. Uh, I read a scripture years and years ago that, uh, man, it just jumped out at me, and I, I had read that passage. Have you ever done this? Have you ever read a passage of scripture, <clears throat> and you've read it over and over and over, <clears throat> and then one day you read it, and wow, it just all like, poof, just jumps out at you? Well, that's what happened to me, and I was reading in Hebrews, uh, the 11th chapter, verse number 5, and I was reading about Enoch, and it said that, that Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. And those two words, please God, I'm telling you, it, 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 they were illuminated. It's like, the, it's like the ink had just jumped off the page and jumped inside of me. And so I began to go on a, I began to go on a, 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 a journey of finding out what Enoch did that was pleasing to God. How did he please God? What was it he did that pleased God? And I, I, I found out. So some of that I'm going to share with you. So what, now watch this here because this gets really neat here. He has shown you, old man, what is good. Verse 8. And what does the Lord require of you? Now watch. But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Wow. Wow. The phrase he has showed thee refers to the fact that God is bringing forward or bringing forward a revelation and making it known with clarity what God wants. In other words, uh, when the, the term showed thee uh, out of the Hebrew, it's like bringing it to light or, de or declaring it. Uh, it's kind of like, like I said, studying the word of God or hearing a message or hearing a song and the light goes off. I mean, or the light comes on rather. The light comes on. It's like, wow, this is awesome. I didn't realize this. I didn't know this. But wow, this is, I can take this now and apply it to my life. There's three things that are mentioned in this scripture that are entirely important to you and I as, as children of God. Let's look, but before we get to these three, look at this phrase. Oh, man, what is good? He said, I showed the old man what is good. That term in the Hebrew means... I've showed you what is good. I've showed you what is pleasant. I've showed you how beautiful excellency is. And the importance of this term is to bring to light a moral goodness as contrasted with moral evil. Whew, wow. So God's trying to do something in our lives. These two phrases would take Israel back to what was spoken to them under Moses uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, they are they are now as they they are as good now as they were then. I'm talking about the word that God's given. Now comes wow. Now comes what's required of us. Not only were these required of Israel, but I believe with my whole heart that they're required of us. Now comes what God has always listen to this. God has always desired. Uh, uh, men to have genuine, heartfelt, intimate, personal relationship with you. God's always desired that. That's what God's wanting for you and, 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 and for all. Yeah, I, I don't know. You, you, maybe you've never been down this road that I'm getting ready to, to talk about a little bit. I, I've been there a time or two. Uh, and, and, I mean, you can't be married for almost 40 years and, and, and not have some of these. I, what Julie and I have it. We don't do it very often now. But years ago, we used to have what I called marital discussions. And, 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 and sometimes those marital discussions would put you in one room and her in another room, waiting for somebody to apologize. Uh, and I'll, I'll not tell you how the end the results of that was. With, <laughs> but it, I mean, and, and, and I've looked at this and I thought, you know, sometimes we treat God that way. God's, we're in this room and we've placed God. Over here in that room, and there's no relationship. We say we love each other, but there's no relationship. Think about it. Because we let whatever it was divide our relationship or put a stop to it. Well, God is still, even, even with all the evil that is in our world today, God is still desiring a genuine, heartfelt, intimate, personal relationship from you and I 
with him. Praise God. That just excites me. Okay. The following requirements, which I made mention of a while ago, were first made known to Israel in Deuteronomy. Chapter 10, if you want to look those up later. <clears throat> Thus Israel would have no excuse to not walk in them. The first question is, Amos asked this. Can two, I love this. Think about this for a minute. Can two walk together except they be agreed? God's asking his question through the prophet Amos. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Wow. Now, <laughs> when I was doing some research on this, and, and, and I come across that particular statement as the Holy Spirit was leading me, I, I, man, he brought it to my mind, and it was just, think about this. If you and I are going to walk with God, guess what? We've got to agree with him, not trying to get him to agree with us. In other words, we've got to say, God, you're right. I'm wrong, and I'm the one that needs change, not you. So in order to walk with God, I, got to, I must agree with his word. I must agree with what he's telling me. I must agree uh, with what uh, he's showing me uh, in, in my life. So with that in mind, the, the, God's desire is for you and I to be partakers of what I'm just getting ready to show you. Number one, God said to do justly. <clears throat> I'm asking you and I'm requiring of you to do justly. Well, what, 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 what does that mean? What does it mean to do justly? Well, in the Hebrew, it means to come to a proper verdict. Wow. It means to do requires an effort on our part of the believer with the idea of creating and constructing and accomplishing in order to acquire from God, okay? What is it we, what is it we are to acquire? We're to do justly. What's this? It also means to live honestly, to live honestly. Now, I, I, I'm sure that I'm not the only person that's listened to my voice that's ever told what we used to call a little white lie. Well, you know what? A, a lie is a lie. I don't care what color we want to put on it. We can color it purple or green or whatever, but a lie is a lie. Uh, 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 and and uh, probably at one time or another, we get put in a spot, and we you just, well, geez, just tell a little white lie to get. Well, that's not, that's not living, living honestly. Okay, listen to this. To do justly is also, as I made mention earlier, to reach a proper verdict. Now, this is important right here. We, can, we cannot pass judgment on a person. However, we can make a proper judgment concerning what situations are around us. We can look at things that are around us, and we can make a proper uh, 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 judgment about what's going on around us and understand here's what's happening. And I think this is one of the things that happened to the church in 2020 is that we got hit with a crisis in America, all over the world, and all of a sudden, rather than taking time to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I need to give proper judgment to see what's going on here. I'm telling you, uh, it may not happen in your personal life, but I'm telling you, fear hit the church. Fear hit the child of God. And still, still in fear. I, this is, bless her heart, I... Uh, I'll tell this to my mother-in-law. Uh, the other day, they were coming by the by the uh, the house, and and uh, now they won't get out and come in, but uh, uh, they were bringing something, a desk or something, over to me, and so I, I came out of the house to help uh, uh, my father-in-law get, uh, get something out of the truck, and just as I stepped out of my door on my front porch, my mother-in-law said, uh, "Can you please put on a mask?" I'm like. Wait a minute. I am not going to get that close. And I'm at my house. <laughs> and rather than argue and end up with one of those marital discussions, I went in the house and put on a mask. And, and a afterwards, I told Julie about it. Julie said, that's crazy. That's crazy. And I said, well, let me tell you something, though. It's beyond crazy. It's fear. It's fear. I'm not saying you're afraid because you're wearing a mask. That's not what I'm saying at all. And if you think that, 
uh, you're not hearing what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when this pandemic hit the church, the church began to run scared. And watch this. Fear and faith cannot operate at the same time. We got to make a righteous judgment about what's going on around us. Now, how do we do that? That's a great question. How do we do that? Brother Mike, how, how do we make a righteous judgment? Well, here, here's how we do it. We make a righteous judgment, and Paul told Timothy to do this way. He said, rightly, rightly divide the word of truth. In other words, we need to look into the word and see what's going on. And, and a measure with what's happening around us with the word. We need to look at it in that respect. Okay? Now, uh, as believers in Christ... We must come into agreement with the Word, no matter what or who else does or doesn't. It must be you and I agreeing with God, not trying to get God to agree with us. See, it doesn't matter what everybody else does. Don't, you, you can't measure your life by somebody else. you got to measure your life by the Word of God. I mean, sure, there's great people that we can follow and learn things from and all that, but, but it's, it, I mean, as far as... Me changing things because someone else is doing a certain thing? No, 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 no. You, 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 you got you to gotta walk this thing between you and God. Number two that's mentioned in the Scriptures is he said to love mercy. Now, <clears throat> I love this word here. Because this word mercy is translated from the Hebrew, and it is the closest Old Testament word that we have that is equivalent to the New Testament word grace. So in other words, you can, you can take this word here, mercy, and you can mingle that word with the word grace and be correct. Now, I like this because when you, begin, when you and I begin to walk into grace, uh, we begin to find some things out by God. How many know grace is the way God does things? He does things by grace. I like this because grace incorporates two commandments. Wow. Which Jesus said were the most, the most important. And he said, to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had some neighbors that that's been really tough to do. And uh, I still have folk that that's really tough to do now, you may say, "Oh, I just love everybody." Well, and somebody hadn't slapped you upside your face then, because because that's gonna that's gonna let you think, "Well, do I really now?" You got this big old bruise on your jaw, and and well, anyway, you know what I'm saying. Grace, <laughs> grace is also incorporated is is, is called uh, God's uh, God's uh, uh, operational power. Remember what he told. How, how, now, how do we take that over to the New Testament? How do we take that over in our everyday lives? Remember when Paul was talking about all the things that he had been through in 2 Corinthians chapter 11? He talked about all the stuff that had happened, all the things that had warred against him. And then he goes into chapter 12 and he begins to talk about the thorn in his flesh. Well, it's been amazing to me. And I, I don't, I don't, I certainly do not. Uh, uh, think of myself as a Bible scholar, but it's difficult for me to understand why folk had been able to get this. Because Bible scholars, and you can still get commentaries, everybody has an opinion about what Paul's uh, flesh was. Some say the thorn in his flesh was because he was a dwarf. I don't know if Paul was a dwarf or not. I... I, I I, and, and you know, honestly, I really don't care whether he was or whether he wasn't. It doesn't matter to me. Some have said that. Some said it was his failing eyesight because of all those times that he was in prison and had to do things by candlelight, da 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 some, some, some have said it's this and it's that. But you know what is amazing to me? The Bible tells us what it is. It's a messenger from Satan coming around to slap him here and there. To knock him around. Paul said, I, I knew that. I found out that, man, this is a messenger from Satan. And the King James Version uses the word buffet, which means to slap and knock around. And Paul said, I sought the Lord three times to take this thing away from me. 
And do you know that God never did say he would take it away, but he did say he would do something in the life of Paul <laughs> uh, to get his mind off of the stat stuff and get his mind on God's operational power. And God said, Paul, my grace is sufficient. Rather than looking at all the stuff you've been going through, look at what I'm taking you, the journey you are spiritually. Look at what's inside of you. Now, in another book, Philippians, Paul makes a statement. He said, I found out, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I found out how to live contently. He said, I, you know, Paul said, I've been exalted, I've been brought low, I, I, I've been hungry, I've been full, I've been clothed, but yet I've been, I've been cold. But I found out that no matter what state I'm in, no matter what condition I'm in, to be therefore content. Now, here's what Paul's saying. That does not mean a contentment that just lays back and let everything happen. That's not what that means. What Paul is saying is this. I've learned this, that no matter what is happening outside of me, God is still working on the inside of me. You, we got to get a hold of that. No matter what's, what's going on on the outside of me, God's working something on the inside of me. And what he's doing on the inside of me is far greater than what's going on the outside of me. See, I think the church has lost sight of this. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Let me tell you something. God's greater than any kind of pandemic. He is. He's greater. This thing has not changed God. It's not going to change God. And listen, we who keep our faith in him will walk in a life of victory no matter what is going on around us. Somebody said, well, that sounds like mind over matter. No, no, that's faith over fear. That's what it is. It's faith over fear. Now watch this. Here's the third thing. Man, and I really like this one here too. God said, here's what I require. To walk humbly with thy God. Wow. Walk humbly with our God. What does that mean? That means that we must walk in humility and cease from the way we want to do things and begin to do things the way God wants them done. Now I have found out this over the years of the ministry, that sometimes, sometimes when we don't pray and we just jump into something because we feel like that's what is good and we should do, comes out to be a bad thing for us. Man, I don't care what's put before you. You need to give that thing a matter of prayer. You need to give that thing a matter of worship. You need to give that thing a matter of praise. And then with all of that, with a, listen for a still small voice to give you that direction. Now, I, I just, I'm just telling you, I, that's something that, that I've learned to do over the years. It, that, I mean, that's the only way it's going to work. Jesus said this. Jesus said to them all, watch this. If any man comes after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, I'm not going to get involved in all the phrases in that scripture, but I do want to say this. Denying ourselves. Denying ourselves is the same as humbling ourselves under the hand of God. Saying, okay, God, okay, God, I've, I've got this now. I understand that in following you every day, I've got to do it your way. I have got to do it your way. Wow. Now, I want you to think about this because this is important here. All these three things that I just showed you, and I'm going to show you a, 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 a couple more. Uh, that's recorded in the New Testament. But watch this. All these things that God has put before Israel now, right now, they're not works that God wants them to do. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Uh, love should be a lifestyle. Honesty and integrity should be a lifestyle. Come on now. Walking with the Lord should be a lifestyle. Doing justly should be a lifestyle. Living by faith should be a lifestyle. I could talk to someone for about five minutes, honestly. And I can, I can, the Holy Spirit always does this with me. I can tell right where they're at in their faith walk. I, I mean, we, we, uh, we uh, show ourselves by what comes out of our mouth. By what, by what comes out of our mouth, okay? 
<clears throat> what the Lord is proclaiming here now, we've got to get this. What the Lord's proclaiming here now to Israel is not the way to salvation, but the result of salvation. In other words, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly, those are not works that get you saved. They are things you do because you're saved. Okay? In other words, Paul made this statement one time. He said, you know what? Follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, if I'm following Christ, follow behind me. But if I'm not, you, you just need to sit aside and not go where I'm going if I'm not following Christ. That's the way it should be. Christianity is not a belief. It's a lifestyle. I, I've got to the place in my life to where I, I, I literally, I literally I hate the word religious or the word religion. I, I, religion is something that's man-made. It, it, that's a man. That's a man-made thing. Salvation is something that God's made. We can have all kinds of religions, all kinds of beliefs. Matter of fact, there was a person that that did prayer. I think I don't can't remember if it was in the House or the Senate just the other day. A preacher now, and during his prayer, we're talking about a gospel preacher that during his prayer. He gave glory to Allah. Now think about it for a minute. Hold on a second. Uh, Allah's gone, man. Allah, you know, come on now. We, if we're going to give glory to anything or to anybody, it's got to be Jesus Christ and what he's done at the cross. So what does this all mean? These are required of every believer today. However, there's only one way. To walk with him. Watch. Number one. There's only one way to please God. And that is living in faith. However, this is not just your ordinary, usual, everyday faith. But it is taking your faith to a new level and having faith in the cross and the finished work of Jesus Christ. Everything and every promise of God that you and I have access today has, has been because of the cross. The cross is the means of everything that you and I could ever receive from God. It's the means of your everyday needs being met. However, with that, Jesus Christ is the source. That's the kind of faith we got to have. Not just your, God's not looking for people with just what I call average, ordinary Daily faith that gets upset over situations. I mean, come on. I can remember back a few years ago when I used to work in the, in the, uh, uh, the world before I ever started preaching the gospel. And I can remember Blue Mondays. <laughs> Who wanted to get out of bed on a Monday, man? And, 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 and the clock would go off and you'd have to well, click it one more time. <laughs> clock would go off and you Click it one more time. I, I kind of did that this morning. I had uh, last night. I, have you ever went to, have you ever been real tired and real sleepy? And then you go to bed and your eyes get like this. And then your mind starts going over a million things. That happened to me last night. I went to bed at a good time. I felt I was tired. And man, I no longer, my head no longer hit the pillow. And my eyes go <laughs> like this. So I get up and I'm thinking, well, I'm not even tired now. And Julie was still in the front room. She said, I, she said, I'm not even tired. I said, I'm not either. So, so, so at midnight, when you're not tired, the best thing to do is go get you something to eat, of course. So I went and got me a little bite to eat. Well, it, wasn't a, it was a pretty good size, but it, was a, it helped me out. So, 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 so then, I, then I decided, okay, uh, I set up for a little while. Ended up about 2 o'clock, falling asleep. Well, then the clock goes off this morning, and Julie said, it's time to get up. I said, hit it one more time, just, just one more time, and, uh, and then, and then uh, she hit it one more time. She said, you've got to get up now. I wanted to say, hit it one more time, but I knew if I did that, I'd be late getting here, and Brian would get all in my stuff for being late, so I just... Decided to get up, get dressed, get myself here. <laughs> so on the way 
Brother Tony, I woke up. So I was, I was good. Oh, I was good. I was good on the way. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2 and 20 says the only way to live that kind of life is by the faith of the Son of God and what he's done for us. Number two, here's something that I believe is one of the most important issues that's missing in the church today. We must, as believers, give latitude to the Holy Spirit to empower us and walk in the Word of God. It's troubling to me that, that we don't hear the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Anymore, it's the Holy Spirit. Nobody wants to call him the Holy Ghost. Uh, in lot, it's, it's sad that you don't hear him preached about in a lot of churches today. You don't hear a lot of teaching about the Holy Spirit. However, the Holy Spirit is the very one that, 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 that gives us the power and the ability to do what I just taught you today, what I just preached to you today. Because we can't do these things. Listen, I, 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 I can't walk humbly before the Lord without the presence of the Holy Spirit. I can't do justly and rightly divide the Word of God w w without walking in the Holy Spirit. I can't, do, I, can't, I can't love mercy without walking in the Holy Spirit. So we must, we've got to get ourselves out of the way and give latitude to the Holy Spirit to work in us. Now, where does the Holy Spirit get his latitude? Number one, the Holy Spirit will never, ever lead us out of anything that was not accomplished at the cross. In other words, his latitude is this. Jesus Christ laid it down, so what was finished at the cross is the life that I'm going to lead you into. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And you can find that out and read and study in, in Romans chapter, well, Romans chapter 6 first shows us the newness of life. Romans chapter 8 shows us the latitude of how the Holy Spirit works. In our life, we got to, folk, we got to bring him back into our church. We got to bring him back in our, in our lives. We have got to get to the place to where we're standing on the word of God. And now what I'm about to say is going to, it's probably going to hurt because it hurts me to even say it, is this. We've got to stop our murmuring and our grumbling and our complaining. Someone asked me the other day, it's, it, see, I'm the, I'm the kind of person that if you, if you really don't want my opinion, uh, don't ask me. But if you ask me, I'm going to tell you. Whether you want to agree with it or not, doesn't matter to me. Someone asked me the other day, what do you think is wrong with us right now? What do you think? I said, Here, here's what I think is wrong with us. We, we're talking about the enemy too much. We're talking about the pandemic too much. And if you get in some circles, you've got to agree with this. If you've been around much, you get in some circles, they'll talk about that three or four times more than they will talk about God, even if God comes into the conversation. Come on now. You know what that's doing? That's spreading fear. We've got to get our talk right, folk. We have got to get our talk right. Our talk shows us where we're at, 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 at in at in faith. I'll get it out here in just a minute. And I'm this kind of person. You know, of course, I've learned this over the years. I, I, I wasn't always this way. But I've learned this over the years that God is the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. So it, even though it may matter politically, uh, but it's not going to change my belief in God, whoever's in the White House. God's still God. I know, I know there's been a lot of prophecies about this and about that. That doesn't change my attitude, and it doesn't change my mindset about God. God's still God. God's still greater than what's the matter. Hallelujah. And we will all be dead but God. Amen? So there's got to be a change. And these things that I've given you today as the Holy Spirit laid on me, uh, uh, they're not the way of salvation, the way to salvation, but they are manifested after salvation. They don't, you don't do these to get saved. You do these because you are saved, because you have salvation in the Lord. Thank you today. Well, I want to pray for you just as we get ready to dismiss. And I want to thank all of you by the way of social media. Uh, if you got really upset with some of the things that I said, just email pastor. He'll take care of that. So... Uh, I'm taking care of you, Pastor. I'm just letting you know.
So I'm not telling you my email address. You didn't give us. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Well, I'm serious, but I'm teasing. You ever, do you ever seriously tease? Sure, I do. But anyway, Pastor, we love you. We love all of you that's been listening today and for the opportunity that we've had to come before you. Heavenly Father, I ask you right now, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, who paid the ultimate price, that we could all begin to walk in salvation. Lord, I've tried with my feeble ability to walk under your anointing today to, to express and proclaim the Word of God. Help us, God, to be, start doing justly. Help us, God, to love mercy and grace. Help us to walk humbly before you and keep all of our faith in the cross and the finished works of Jesus Christ. I rebuke the fear that's been trying to operate in people's lives. The sicknesses and the disease that has hit so many. We stand against that in the name of Jesus. And we proclaim a divine healing from the top of their heads to the very soles of their feet. And Lord, we pray for that one today that may have hurt us. That's not saved. That one that does not know Jesus Christ. Lord, I just ask that the Holy Spirit will tug at their heart and pull them towards you. And Lord, they'll enter into your kingdom. Lord, begin to walk. Begin to walk under the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we forever praise you and we forever glorify you and worship you in Jesus' name. And everybody say man and amen. God bless you till next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah.